and welcome to Seven Days in Europe. Seven days the people of Cyprus and indeed anyone with savings in a Eurozone bank are unlikely to forget. One large Cyprus bank is to close and uninsured depositors, many of them from Russia, stand to lose a fortune. With me in the studio is German Aldi member Wolf Klintz and in a moment we shall be discussing the crisis. But first, it's a yes-no sequence in which I shall ask a series of questions to which I'd like you to answer just yes or no. Has the Cyprus crisis damaged the euro? To some extent, yes. Does this show we need a banking union more? Yes. Would one have saved the Cypriot banks? With a banking union? Well, I guess yes. Concerned that, uh, are you concerned that recent events have stirred up anti-German feelings in, in Cyprus, Greece and, and so on? Unfortunately, you're right. Has the Eurogroup handled this latest one well? No, not ideally. Joram Dysonblum says that this could be a model for future bailouts. Is he right? I think in substance he may well be right, but the way he has communicated is poor. The, the markets were rattled. The euro dropped for 0.8% in value overnight. Uh, is that worrying? Not really. Could have dropped more. <laughs> Can public confidence in the euro be restored? Yes. Well, thank you. Should depositors in Italy, Spain and Ireland perhaps be worried? No. Can anti-EU feeling in the countries affected be overcome? I hope so. And are citizens right to blame the EU? No. OK, well, there we go. That's the, that's the end of our yes-no sequence. Um, looking at the, we're going to be looking at the, the, the main stories of the week, the main news stories of the week. But, of course, obviously the first one is the Cyprus uh, banking sector. I mean, what do you feel, what are the lessons that we've learned from that initially? Well, I think the lessons that we've learned uh, are uh, twofold. One, uh, a banking sector should not really be out of comp proportion compared to the GDP of a country. And second, the business model of a banking sector, particularly when it is big, has to be sound and sustainable. Um, but how you said that, you said that uh, the banking sector shouldn't be bigger than the economy, but it's eight times the size of the GDP of Cyprus. The banks in, in Luxembourg are 24 times the size. Yeah, but they have a different, a different business model, and, and, and that is much more sustainable, so that makes a difference. OK, there's much more to say on that, I know, but first I look at this week's news with Caroline Grasso. <laughs> Chypre sauvé de la faillite, mais à quel prix Au lendemain de l'accord destiné à sauver Chypre de la banqueroute, réaction mitigée des groupes politiques du Parlement. Si tous saluent le fait que les dépôts inférieurs à 100 000 euros aient été épargnés, la manière dont a été gérée la crise est mise en cause. Pour le président du Parlement, Martin Schulz, il est plus que jamais urgent de réaliser l'union bancaire en Europe. Que faire des vieux navires en fin de vie Mardi, les députés de la commission environnement ont adopté de nouvelles règles pour mieux encadrer le recyclage des anciens bateaux. Trop souvent, ceux-ci sont démontés hors de l'Union européenne dans des pays en voie de développement. Le démantèlement échappe la plupart du temps au contrôle de sécurité et de salubrité. Objectif, recycler davantage en Europe en respectant les travailleurs et l'environnement. Quel avenir pour l'aide alimentaire en Europe Lundi, les députés de la commission agriculture ont dit oui à une nouvelle enveloppe pour l'aide aux plus démunis pour la période 2014-2020. 2,5 milliards d'euros pour 7 ans, c'est moins que les années précédentes, mais c'est davantage que la proposition initiale de la commission européenne. Les négociations continuent entre le Parlement et les États membres, la suite en commission emploi. You're watching Seven Days in Europe. Wolf Clint, do you feel that the Cyprus deal that's been done has changed the way we're going to handle countries in, in trouble in future? Well, I, I hope that we learn the lessons and, and realize that it's not just the, the, the substance of the decision that we take, but also the way we communicate. Because after the first uh, round of negotiations, when they had reached an agreement which was not acceptable, as we know, because small savers would have had to participate in footing the bill, the communication process was really a catastrophe. And uh, it led to uh, unrest and, and uncertainty and, and, and lack and loss of, of confidence in other countries. And that, of course, should have been avoided. So I think we have in the future, we have to think of all the possible and potential uh, consequences also on the Union as a whole and, and on other countries uh, when we do negotiate. Now, in substance, I think what has come out now in the second round of negotiations is uh, not that surprising, namely that the shareholders uh, are being called upon 
Uh, second, those that own bonds are being called upon. Uh, and, and thirdly, those that own more than 100,000 euro because the deposit guarantee schemes that we have agreed upon in Europe uh, do protect uh, savers up to 100,000. So it's clear that those that are beyond above 100,000 are not being protected 100%. But Mr. Dijsselbloem came in for a lot of stick from the um, Economic Affairs Committee when, when he appeared before it. But he, he made the point to me afterwards saying that taking a haircut of the smaller depositors was not an interference with the um, deposit guarantee scheme because it was a different type yes, of taking yes, money. But he, he, I think he's a politician. Maybe he, I do know that he's been a finance minister of the Netherlands only since November one and head of the Eurogroup since the beginning of this year but nonetheless he should have known that the normal ordinary citizens would not be able to see the difference between a special one-time levy and losing a part of, of the savings below 100,000 and therefore this was badly handled in my opinion I'm not saying that Dijsselbloem himself or alone uh, is to blame. In fact, the whole group is to blame, including and in particular, of course, the Cypriots, because they have come forward with that uh, proposal. But everybody that finally agreed to that proposal should have known better. I, I was at uh, Frankfurt uh, last week uh, at the ECB, and there was a, a conference on the, uh, the post-trade uh, settlement system that yes. they're introducing. And there, even people from the central security depositories, the big players yeah. in the financial market, were saying this was a really bad deal and yes. a bad idea. Yes, I, I I, I couldn't agree more. It, it, it was a bad idea and it was badly communicated uh, and therefore unnecessarily. It, it led to a lot of uh, problems elsewhere and, and you know, you, you asked the question before, should, should savers in, in other countries, Italy, Portugal, Spain, etc. be worried? I think they should not be worried because the deposit guarantee scheme is working. And there's no idea whatsoever to change that. So up to 100,000, everybody's savings are safe and protected. But they have reason to be worried after that incident. Look, in Germany, there is now an anti-Euro party that's been formed and is, is, yes. is campaigning for votes. How concerning is that? I don't think it is very, very much concerning. It's the alternative for Germany, as it's being called. And uh, they are not necessarily anti, they are neither anti-euro nor anti-Europe. Uh, they are anti-euro in the current sense. What they are saying is that the common currency, the euro, is too strong for some countries. And they are right when they say so. For instance, for Cyprus, that for Cyprus the currency is just too strong. They are not competitive at the current uh, strength level of, of, of the currency. So what they are saying is the southern countries, you know, from Portugal right to, to Cyprus, they should have their own southern euro and the north, central and northern countries should have what they call the northern euro. And the two may start at the same parity now, and probably five, five or ten years from now, the southern country, uh, the southern euro will probably be worth only 85 cents of the northern, or even 80 or 75 of the northern euro. Now, in theory, this is a good idea, I think, it, 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 because it reflects economic realities. But politically, this would be a disastrous message. There are stories coming out in America that um, the, uh, the lawyers in Cyprus are being contacted by lawyers in Malta, Liechtenstein, and, and, uh, and Luxembourg, Luxembourg yes. trying to persuade them to move capital out of Cyprus. So what's going on there? Because it shouldn't be possible, should it? Well, everybody can talk to everybody else in, in, in Europe. We have a free society. But if that were right, and I haven't heard it, but if, if that were right, I think it, it would be appalling, really, because it would show that uh, some uh, member states and, and, and you know, professionals in these member states try to exploit the misery and the difficulties of another member state in, in a rather uh, poor manner. And I think that is the least that we want to have. We want to stand together. We do not want to divide each other. And so if that were the case, I think it, 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 it should not be tolerated. Very, very briefly, if Cyprus is to recover, its economy is to recover, yeah. obviously tourism and banking are yeah. its main industries. It looks as if the banking industry has been destroyed. Well, it's been certainly reduced uh, heavily uh, to a level that maybe can be sustained o over the years. Now, I think, I think Cyprus, uh, based on, on tourism alone, uh, and a very small 
uh, probably still fragile banking sector would have a hard time to survive. But f thank God they do have also uh, reserves, oil and gas that has been detected. So I think the European Union should, should support Cyprus very much and, and, and be, on short term to really exploit those resources. OK, Wolf Clint, thank you very much indeed. I'm afraid we have run out of time, although I suspect this is a subject that we may well be revisiting in the months ahead. Goodbye for okay. now and thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take a seat. You're watching Seven Days in Europe. According to the World Health Organization, 20 to 30,000 people a year in the EU die from diseases related to asbestosis, and that number may rise. Now the European Parliament has overwhelmingly adopted a report to deal with the problem, written by my studio guest, British socialist Stephen Hughes. We'll be discussing the issue, but first, our yes-no sequence, in which I ask a series of questions to which I'd like you to answer just yes or no. Okay. Have working people been made to make bear too much of the burden in the economic crisis? Yes. Will ordinary savers feel worried uh, after the Cyprus bailout? Yes. It looks more hopeful now that food aid, at least to the poorest, is going to continue. Is that a relief? Yes. Are you concerned that in 2013 Europe still needs soup kitchens? Absolutely, yes. <laughs> Europe is making itself unpopular, isn't it, with ordinary people? Yes. Can that be put right? Um, perhaps. <laughs> that doesn't sound convincing. <laughs> Are we likely to be exposed to asbestos for many more years to come? Yes. Uh, is there more about than people actually realise? Yes. Is there less danger now that we've realised how dangerous it is at least? No. Is it going to be very expensive to get rid of? Yes. In the current crisis, are you worried about the rise of fringe parties? Yes. Could the EU be derailed by Beppo Grillo or by Golden Dawn in Greece? Uh, no. Would it help if the EU decisions were more transparent? Yes. OK, well, that's, thank you very much indeed for taking part in that. We now have a short report on the asbestos question, but just before that, whatever action uh, the EU takes, asbestos is going to be going on damaging health for some time to come, isn't it? How, how dangerous is it? Extremely dangerous. We have millions of tons of it still locked up in the, the, the walls, floors, ceilings of our homes, churches, community centres, um, and there is no safe limit, uh, level of exposure to asbestos. Uh, one fibre can eventually kill 30, 40 years later. It's a long latency period. And it, 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 people say, oh, white asbestos isn't as dangerous as blue or brown. They're all dangerous. The All three types are, yeah, are dangerous. There is no safe level of exposure to white asbestos either. OK, well, let's take a look now at this short report on the asbestos issue by Paul Anderson. A graveyard in Belgium for Europe's rusting toxic tubs. Seen another way in this age of recycling, it's a birthplace of sound economic and ecological sense. Usable steel from old boats is big business. First, though, dismantlers have to remove a lurking danger, asbestos. The first protection is to the environment. Uh, when we are working, taking away the asbestos, that the fibres are not going out of the vessel. And then the second protection is the individual protection of the workmen. In a village near the Belgian city of Mons, an asbestos death count is taking place. A black dot for every person who worked with the material and died from an asbestos-related disease. The task is managed by Eric Jonker, co-chairman of the main victims' association. Ça me touche de voir que dans les drames humains, il y a des gens qui qui se qui qui osent se lever et qui osent dire non, même à des grands directeurs d'entreprise et à des grands capitaines d'entreprise. The men here came into contact with asbestos when they worked at a now closed factory of the construction materials company Eternit. Je trouve que le gouvernement belge est responsable aussi. Parce que si, il n'y a pas que dans, dans, dans les usines d'amiante, dans les, dans les écoles, on a mis de l'amiante, tout ça, il y a eu des problèmes aussi. Mais eux, ils savaient mon. Mr. Jonker lost his mother, father, who was an engineer at Eternit, and two brothers to mesothelioma. His mother, Francoise, launched a claim through the courts. For the first time in uh, Belgian legal history, a court uh, established the liability of Eternit, saying you were 
For decades, you know exactly what was going on. You know the danger of what you were doing. The HQ of Eternet Belgium. It and associated companies employ around a thousand people. It's coming to terms with the medical, social and business consequences of asbestos. We have a past and we want to tackle the past. And that's the reason also we made a program and that we said, OK, it's not only about recognition of victims, it's broader than that. It's also about supporting the community where we can. The European Parliament wants a series of measures looking at the prospects for abolishing all existing asbestos and getting just recompense for its victims. Governments have taken their eye off the asbestos file, MEPs argue, and it's time now to put the lid finally on a modern-day scourge. Steve Hughes, I mean, that's a fairly horrific story, but it's not untypical, is it, especially in the old industrial areas of Europe, including your own and my own original place, the northeast of England. Absolutely. Many hundreds of thousands of workers were exposed to asbestos, particularly in the shipbuilding industry in regions like mine in the, the northeast of England. But it's a problem everywhere. In churches, schools, hospitals, community centres, the asbestos is still there. In wall panels, ceiling panels, a lot of it's sealed safely away until it needs to be exposed for mint or refurbishment work or indeed demolition and removal. Now you, you want, in your report, you want uh, the asbestos to be gradually removed, well not all that gradually, quite quickly removed from everywhere where it, where it is exposed. But that is a process that's going to take time because particularly in the economic climate, obviously there's a cost involved. Companies that have buildings with asbestos are more likely to want to hide it than to get it out. It's dangerous to move. It is. And there is a, a body of opinion that says it's best left where it is until it needs to be removed. And I fully understand that argument. However, we are, for example, embarking upon a huge programme of including improving the energy efficiency of all of our public buildings within the European Union and indeed private homes. Why not use that opportunity, if we can identify where the asbestos is, to safely catalogue it, remove it and dispose of it. Uh, we set a deadline of 2028. Poland has set a deadline of 2032 to make itself totally asbestos three, uh, free. Uh, the Australian Parliament's just introduced a new bill to remove all asbestos in Australia. So this is a movement that's beginning to gain traction. But th there is asbestos to be found. For instance, there are still mines, open mines, There's, uh, there are uncovered, uh, 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 buried uh, asbestos, there are f there's fly tipping, and the risk of fly tipping especially mm -hmm. uh, if, if uh, c some contractors are uh, not very scrupulous in their removal of the stuff. Yeah, yeah. We make the point in the report actually that uh, the landfill disposal of asbestos is not no longer a safe, a safe option. Um, we have to try to destroy it uh, once it is removed. Uh, we have to also clamp down to make sure that existing licensing and disposal regulations are properly applied across the European Union. I worry particularly about small one-person outfits um, that might think, well, well you know, uh, it, it, it's a bit of a bother to, to, to apply all of these regulations. Let's just get rid of it as quickly as we can. The dangers are very, very real. 20, 30, 40 years from now, it can lead to death from mesothelioma or a range of other asbestos-related diseases. Now, it, the, the, the WHO says that, um, it talks about there's 20 to 30,000 deaths a year, and we haven't reached a peak yet. Why is that? Because we're still coming across it, and the latency period um, for asbestos is very long. Uh, if you breathe uh, in fibres today, they can lie dormant uh, in your system for up to 40 years. It can take up to 40 years for mesothelioma to develop. Once it does develop, we know it was caused by asbestos, it's not caused by anything else, and it's incurable. Uh, and, I mean, there are lots of actual illnesses. I mean, mesothelioma you mentioned, but there's also obviously asbestosis. Yeah. But in fact, it's, it's, it's not just carcinogen. It is, it is deadly in all sorts of ways. It is, it is. I mean, pleural plaque is a, a major cause of death as well. Um, so yes, there are many ailments uh, associated with it. Another point we make in the report is that we need to try to improve the recognition of asbestos-related diseases across the the European Union and our compensation for diseases related to asbestos. How do you destroy it though? By definition, you can't burn it, you can't bury it. What do you do with it? It's got to be defragmented. I, you have to totally uh, um, demolish it uh, down to basic molecules uh, to, to make it safe. Once you, once you stop it being in fibrous form, the danger is removed. It's the fibres that are the problem. As long as it remains in a fibrous form, those fibres can effectively burrow into your lung lining 
and plural lining, and that's where the problem begins. Now, your report calls for more screening and more information for the workers who have to work with it, more special training even for, for architects and, and engineers who have yes. to work with it. And that's going to take a while to implement, isn't it? It is, and it, it requires resources, but I think it's an urgent problem. Um, if we look at a, a, a cold, harsh cost-benefit analysis of all of this, the costs of not acting now are huge, absolutely enormous in the medium to long term. So it's worth making that investment now. Is, how important was the, the 2012 Turin judgment in which a former owner and a former director of a, of a company were made to pay damages for 3,000 deaths, I think it was? Crucially important, and we we're seeing similar judgments across the world. I mean, it's not uh, insignificant that a number of the former major manufacturers and producers of asbestos in the United States uh, filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy a, dec a decade ago. They tried to hide from their responsibilities. I'm pleased to see in your film that this Belgian company are owning up to their past uh, responsibilities. A lot are trying to hide from them. We've, the courts are stopping that. OK, Stephen, I'm afraid we've run out of time there. It looks like we're going to be living with the legacy of asbestos for quite a long time yet. My thanks to Stephen Hughes and, of course, to you for watching. Goodbye.